last year was super chaotic. Everyone came up with an idea, got funding, started poaching people from each other, giving money to consumers to download products. They will never make money. Yeah? And I don't think that's a good market for anyone. Nobody wants to visit your branch in the metaverse. They don't want to do it in the real world. Why would they go to the virtual world for it? Yeah. I, I think when the real cases emerge of real business in metaverse, I think that's when you see real opportunities. The use cases need to be relevant. They have to be valuable. They have to be material. And 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 I think the banks need to look at this as different. Yeah. It's not just about the idea. It's about the governance. It's making sure your security is tight, making sure your platform is scalable, yeah? Because that's the biggest pitch everyone has. Go and launch your MVP. Once you get out with the MVP, what does MVP2 take? And I think that's where most fintechs break. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services. A future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech and technology. Ardian is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with To You, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. To You connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia, expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDA's vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage, and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending, and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards, and more. Hello, everybody. I'm Arjun, your host for Couchonomics. I guess uh, I'm a familiar enough face. I should stop introducing myself. Uh, but more importantly, I'm very excited about today's show because we're going to talk about most things digital and neo banking. Uh, and more specifically, digital and neo banking in this region and in the UAE. Joining me today is Jayesh Patel. He is the CEO of Vio Bank, a bank which was launched, if I'm not wrong, uh, in the last six months. Uh, and what's very interesting about Vio is that they are, uh, well, they've begun their journey uh, with targeting, uh, in my opinion, the most underserved segment that exists in the market, which is the small, the micro uh, businesses, which account for maybe 99% of the enterprise here, definitely a significant percentage of the, the GDP. So with that, uh, let me uh, uh, say hello to Jayesh and welcome him to the couch. Thank you, Arjun. It's a pleasure being here. And I hope, as I have to ask everybody, is the couch comfortable enough? You know what? I'm super excited to be on this famous couch. It's super comfy. <laughs> well, I, I but thank you for the famous bit, right? Um, feel free. It's you know this is a chat, right? Uh, I, I I don't position the show as a fireside conversation. So uh, let's have a dialogue. 
um, 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 if my questions are foolish, you can always come back and correct me. Uh, but you know, uh, I think there is, uh, I think there's a lot of people in my audience who I actually have had write to me, uh, wanting to have this episode. And, and to be honest with you, we waited, uh, and we didn't push you hard in our season one because we wanted you to launch the bank and have, as they say, some runs on the board before yes. we actually bring you in. Yeah. Otherwise, that we thought it would be more of a hypothetical conversation. Now, Jesh, I, I, uh, you know, pleasantries aside, which I'm sure we'll have enough time before and after the show, we have a finite amount of time. So I want to dive straight in, right? And I'm going to ask a, a question which gets asked uh, or discussed quite often. Is banking from a customer's perspective broken? Yeah. So that's a loaded question. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you my view. Yeah. I think there's room to improve banking. Yeah. Uh, I think in some areas it functions very well. Uh, I, I think in some areas there's significant room to improve. I think if you look at the evolution of banking, what has really happened? You had this time where you had branches and everyone focused on making branches better. Then you had online banking. And then it, it took a while for mobile to come. So when I came to the region uh, about 15 years ago, I remember about 10 years ago, so we were trying to push mobile banking yeah, when it had just started. Yeah? And it was very hard for uh, customers to take it up. Yeah? I think what has happened is the rate at which technology has changed is incredibly fast. Yeah. And what we are seeing is a lag in banking adopting these changes, yeah, because they have heavy infrastructures, they have a lot of controls, yeah. And what the net result is, the customers don't end up with the experience they get from their social media apps or their uh, on-demand TV apps or their shopping apps, yeah. Uh, so I definitely think there's room to improve. Uh, that's why we were born. Uh, but uh, I do think banks are doing a decent job yeah, uh, in the market. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to challenge this again, right? right. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm as much as a customer and I have, you know, I have, I, I talk to a number of banks, I work with a number of banks in my, in my sort of capacity as a, as, as a, as a partner in a consulting firm, right? Um, I think the word broken is a bit polarizing, right? It's, yeah. you know, it's either broken or unbroken. But, I do sometimes wonder uh, on two accounts. One is, uh, yes, you're completely correct. I think the speed at which technology is shifting and the both the width and the depth of that yeah. technology is been tremendous over the last decade, right? Yep. Um, um, and obviously that's impacted consumer behavior, that's uh, impacted uh, other elements of it. But, but there are two things which I always question. One is, do the banks invest sufficiently in talent, yeah. which can understand that that technology and deconstruct yeah. it in a manner that is reusable, usable for a bank. And if I may ask the second part of that question, please yeah. feel free to, to disagree or agree, is banks in the region, generally the big ones at least, uh, have always sort of had a great time, right? I, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I don't know when, which... I might have to go back over a decade when they might have had a hard time. Yeah. Do they really care? Because in a way, I guess we all need a bank. Yeah. So how are you going to answer those two? And I'm sorry to put you on the corner no. in the first three minutes of this conversation. <laughs> no, I think both very good questions. I, I, I think, I, look, I worked for a large bank, yeah? And uh, one of the big things is, I, I think there's important elements in it. One of the big things is with change in technology, consumer expectations are changing. Yeah. But if you look at the product portfolio of banks, they are not really changing. No. What is shifting is an improvement in delivery channel. So you see a nicer mobile app, you see a better uh, ATM interface, yeah? But when it comes to product restructuring and rethinking it, yeah, I think this is the biggest gap. And, and, and I take the example of BNPL, yeah? Banks knew this about this. Uh, uh, in fact, before any of the players were here, we had talked to, in my previous life, one of the largest BNPL players to bring them here. But people were like, the shift in whether consumers are going to adopt such new products, uh, I think this is where banks are slow. Yeah? Because the traditional products are so profitable, you still want to make 
that Kodak camera that you're so used to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that is the bigger uh, issue: is the acknowledgement that consumer preferences are changing. Yeah. The investment that goes is in the channel and not as much in the product. Yeah. Uh, but now we are beginning to see the shifts in it. I think on the talent side, uh, I think the banks actually try very hard. I think they're very smart people, hence their numbers. Yeah. I know they're incredibly profitable, but there's 30 something of them just in the retail space in this market, yeah, uh, for a fairly small base of consumers. So they are competitive, uh, they have smart people, but when it comes to digitally native smart people, this is where they struggle. Yeah, and this is not just for the traditional banks. If you start looking at fully licensed new banks, yeah, uh, if I'm in a FinTech that is fully unregulated, I can do whatever I want, and launch it faster. Mm-hmm. As soon as I have to go through governance processes, which I think are important, uh, talent starts to shift. Yeah? Yep. There are easier industries to do stuff in. And I think it's, I think the banks have tried globally to attract these folks. Yeah? Uh, but I think they've struggled too. Yeah, mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think they've got to figure no, out I think, I think I think both your points are, are, are quite relevant. I think I'll make a statement rather than actually a counter-argument. I think on the first one, uh, I, I violently agree with you. And I, I'm seeing this in the whole embedded finance space yeah. and BNPL is one, that, that uh, if embedded finance is all about just another channel to peddle existing products, then I think we've missed the point. Exactly. I think, uh, and, and this is not my argument. I read a very interesting article by you know one one of one of the fintech influencers, uh, and I think there were two points made in that that article, or maybe it's two different articles. One was around, I think products need to be built which are fit for this whole new world of embedded Absolutely. finance, right? And the secondly is I think there needs to be, uh, if I may use the term, upgrade of in terms of connectivity and infrastructure which needs to go along with it. So the so the rails need to evolve, if yeah. I may use that term. I think that's the one. I think on the second one, again, you're on the money. Uh, you know, if I am an engineer uh, right now, uh, and if I have a choice to work with Bank X versus FinTech X, um, um, I think I get satisfaction for my work a lot quicker with yeah. FinTech X because I can actually see my idea translated into a product, hitting the market successfully or unsuccessfully in a yeah. much quicker horizon. And I think we all live in this sort of instant gratification world, right? Uh, I- including in our work life. So I do appreciate that, that there is a challenge. I think the banks do have to overcome it. I, yeah. I, 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 I don't think the question is that the challenge doesn't exist. I do think, and there are some banks who are starting to make yeah. an edge. You know, I, I think uh, everything, I, I obviously I don't know JP Morgan very close. It's not someone yeah. I work with every day, but I keep hearing that the things that they're stuff. doing, right? And, and I think they're moving in the right direction. Right. Take a step back. Yeah. Educational question, yes. right? Uh, there, you know, I don't know if there is a right or a wrong answer. In your world, on your words more appropriately, what is the difference between digital banking or digital bank and a neo bank? Yeah, it's a great question. So, look, the way I see it, there is not much. Yeah, uh, I, I think part of the role of a consultant is to make sure things are always interesting. So, <laughs> I think it started out with digital banking. It ran its age for about two or three years, and people said there's got to be a new name for this, and they came up with neo banking. Yeah. I, I, there are some where digital banks are actually owned by a bank. Yeah, uh, there's uh, and, and neo banks are standalone. Yeah, they may be based on prepaid card uh, or even now fully licensed neo banks. Yeah, uh, I just think it's a shift in terminology with time. Yeah? Okay, uh, I, I don't see a huge difference uh, globally. Uh, I, I think maybe neo bank might get you a better valuation. So maybe new companies <laughs> use that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I, I, I don't see a huge difference. Okay, so, 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 so then help me here because because see, um, um I, I've heard it I've heard previously, correctly or incorrectly, right? That that a lot of people used to say, you know, difference between digital bank and neo banks. Neo banks don't necessarily have their own licenses to operate as a bank, so therefore they should not be using the term bank. Uh, and they don't actually have their own balance sheet, yeah. right? So they don't lend on it. I, I think, if I'm not wrong, an example of that could be possibly Chime, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, digital banks typically have both, yeah. right? Uh, uh, we consultants have another word for digital banks launched by incumbent banks. We call them digital attackers. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> suggesting, uh, by no means quote me on, on this, although I will record it. Um, so, okay, so, so I guess... 
what you're suggesting here is that there are a number of definitions out there. It's not sort of, you know, there's no sort of right or wrong. Yeah. New banks have come is a more newer term than digital bank. Um, uh, and you're correct. There are banks like Revolut where in certain markets they are regulated yeah. and in other markets they're not regulated. So they can't actually be called a particular thing because they have, you know, different uh, characteristics, right? But more interesting part of this whole discussion now agnostic of new banks or digital banks, we have somewhere in the region to three to 400 such banks globally, yeah. right? Um, we have some very interesting ones. We have ones like Kakao, which are integrated to a wider ecosystem. Yep. Uh, we have the likes of Tinkoff, who have grown from being, I think, a credit card, credit card to being a beyond banking lifestyle type super app bank. Uh, we have Oak North, who I have the highest regards for, which is, uh, if I may call it, a very product and segment-oriented bank. Uh, we have Quanto uh, coming, you know, I think originated out of, out of France, but in now multiple uh, uh, um, uh, European countries. But the but the, the the point here is that 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 same report or those reports suggested that less than five percent of them are sort of making money. Yeah. Right. Now, my question to you is, is this just a maturation issue, right? Um, or are we, or and or, are we at some sort of cusp of massive consolidation which is going to happen and possibly a number of these banks are going to disappear in the, in the next few years? Yeah, look, I, I think there's been a huge proliferation of digital banks. Some have been tick boxes for companies, yeah, uh, they've done that. Uh, I think quite a few have been uh, have operated on uh, prepaid card platforms, which are fairly easy to do. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it depends on what you really want to do. Yeah, while many of the so, if you want to focus on customer acquisition, there's tons of them going out and just acquiring a ton of customers. Yeah, uh, but if you look at their capabilities, they're incredibly lim uh, limited. Yeah, you have a prepaid card. You're you're largely a payment tool. Yeah, with a very nice experience. Yeah, uh, granted. Yeah, and so, uh, and you can do P2P and a few services, but it's incredibly limited. Yeah, uh, while bankers have many things wrong, they are right on the money. They know exactly where to make the money, and they're doing a fabulous job all around the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, from a shareholder perspective, yeah, the returns are phenomenal. Yeah, I think what there's a few fundamental issues with the way digital banks or uh, neo banks are approaching things. One is they are going single product, yeah, on a product where there's very thin margins. Yeah, with the hope of monetization at some stage. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is many of them are trying to launch with no fees yeah, uh, in everything. No FX fees, no this fees, no that fees. And uh, and over two years, you build up a base. Yeah, The question is how valuable is that base from a monetization perspective? And now you're seeing a bunch of them starting to come up with subscription pa uh, plans yeah, uh, to, to bring some real revenue streams mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, uh, I think, like every industry, I think it's great for them to be, to be a, a proliferation. I think it's great to see new ideas and concepts come up. Yeah, uh, a few years ago, it was how do we build super apps? Yeah, and now there's some like Oak North. You said very product centric, focusing on one uh, or two areas, and they just want to get that right. Yeah, uh, so that I, I think there's significant evolution. What has to happen is look, you've got to make money. Yeah, whether it's today or tomorrow, you have to figure out how to make money. For me, the ones that survive and thrive either figure out new revenue streams that haven't been explored yet, and, and there's very few, like I see crypto as one, where crypto trading is giving uh, income to some of the banks so they seem profitable, the neo banks. That's the second side of the balance sheet. You need to work on that. Yeah? Uh, and I think the banks that start working on the second side of the balance sheet, then they start entering profitability. Yeah? Uh, but when you start lending, is when you'll start making money. Yeah? And, and, and remember, you want to make the customer your primary customer. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, if you look at wallets, and, and you can question whether they've succeeded or not, yeah? uh, but everyone uses wallets based on the incentive I'm getting. 
there's very little loyalty yeah uh, to it and there's very little revenue yeah uh, a lot of neo banks i think if they just focus on transactional debit card transactional or payments based whatever they run the risk of becoming a wallet yeah uh, now if they are wallet like cacao tied to something and then they morph into a bank they have the advantage of an ecosystem that they own yeah uh, or a wechat yeah uh, but if you don't have that supporting ecosystem I, i think it's really hard to make money and at some point investors will run out of patience yeah uh, and that's happening every yeah time. and then you'll start seeing uh, lesser investments lesser incentives and you start seeing the decline of some of them No, I think that's that's interesting, and and I think that's kind of where I stand too. I I do think we are at the cusp of seeing, um, I think uh, uh, either innovation, further inf- innovation will come. I do think we will see some consolidation. We're starting to see evidence yeah. of that, uh, and I think there are some very there are a couple of other interesting things which might happen. I've got a few questions for that. So rather right. than me give the answer, I'll raise the question. Let's talk about digital banks a little bit further. Can digital banks survive as only digital? plays or do you think there comes a time that they need to evolve into some form of a digital model whether themselves or through their partnerships yeah i i think it's a great question yeah i i think there's two elements of it yeah one is what should a digital bank do and and the second part is the partnership part yeah on digital banks i i think if you look at the evolution of banking yeah you had your branch then you had your online yeah and now more people could access it longer then you have mobile on the go i think the next one is a shift in the business model of a bank yeah uh, and we'll talk about this uh, how does the next generation of a bank look like yeah and i think there's one element which is the traditional part which is going b to b a b to c and going to the consumers going to the businesses yeah uh, there's another part where you start becoming a little bit more of an infrastructure or value added player yeah on the part which is purely going to consumers yeah i if i ask you when's the last time you went to a bank branch it's i don't know if you remember but it's probably cause something didn't work yeah uh, and, and so i think the necessity yeah uh, of going to a branch is going down yeah uh, so i think they can adopt a purely digital uh, uh, play if you look at covid one of the upsides from the terrible disaster was there's a huge shift to digital yeah cash in markets yeah which was predominant yeah is going away yeah which i think is paving the way for not having physical locations uh if you are to have physical locations then i think you need partners yeah then no, no, i agree with you because then you start going and saying hey i'm going to be in a uh, this place it's just like shopping malls yeah and the massive stores they have where they have multiple stores in one you provide access in an already available real estate yeah if there is real need yeah i do think if you go up the curve onto corporate banking yeah then you need the personal uh, relationships yeah uh but i think if you look at retail and sme i honestly don't see the need because the consumer does not want to come and meet you yeah uh they just don't see the need and if you need to have a chat have a video chat yeah yeah and there's a lot of good technology out there with chatbots yeah. and so on and so forth i i think there's some some i i i i I don't have the answer for it. Yes. I do think I think we are going to go through uh a, a, a period of flux new models will get yeah. tested. You also have to understand it it's all going to be determined by the segment that you're targeting and Absolutely. what their needs are. But but uh, here's my hypothesis, right? And and I'm going to call it partnership as a service. Yeah. Right? Because why shouldn't I? Right? Um uh, I think what banks need to understand especially new banks who are coming in uh, into the market right who are looking to lower their CAC improve their customer engagement uh, improve LTV right uh, uh, through other sources of income if you look across your entire value chain there is an argument for you to partner across the base yeah. whether in terms of acquiring new customers yeah. whether in terms of servicing them in more than one way which could be digital uh, so there for some physical interaction whether it is in terms of evolving your tech stack and not having everything you know managed in house all the time 
products which could be uh, introduced which are possibly best to breed done by someone else and then services which might come further down the line i do think banks do need to think about how they deal with these partnerships yeah. and how they're able to create win to win we'll see how the time plays out i do yeah. think pa- partnerships are, are, are going to be coming another interesting discussion right is and 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 and, and again um, i don't think there's a right or wrong answer but i do think you will have a view on that incumbents across the world including in the region have tried their hands at what we call digital attackers yeah. right um mixed results yeah okay do you really think incumbents can launch digital banks themselves and if so what's the secret sauce there yeah so i, I did this in a previous life so the answer should be yes no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah I I think there is room to yeah I I really believe there is room to because remember uh incumbent banks have a massive customer base yep. yeah they have a customer base that prefers the traditional way of banking and and ton of them go to branches but they have this emerging new base yeah so I actually think for them it's not a choice they have to do it or tomorrow's customer is not theirs yeah uh how do they go about doing this yeah they have a challenge that they have a massive brand and they have a set of customers who like this but they need to migrate into something new yeah uh and i think the ones who launch a new digital what a uh, bank as a tick box because everyone else is doing it are simply going to fail yeah they have to have a very clear purpose yeah and they have to have a very distinct way of organizing it yeah and, and, and i'll give you an example so uh one of the ones i launched in a previous life it was very clear we want to innovate we want to disrupt we want to see how we become more customer centric yeah go out and build something yeah where banking is in the background the way it's structured uh is separate team separate brand use whatever you like of the bank don't use what you don't like yeah uh and i think that works very well because you start attracting talent and okay. you build an interesting product but if you put the product under the same folks who are running the old products yeah you'll never get never ahead works. you'll never get ahead yeah so i i think organizationally from the chief executive there has to be a very clear mandate yeah everyone's got to help this thing succeed yeah and help explore some of this uh, new ideas they have so i think if you do that you do have an opportunity uh i think the second thing is even if you do that if you measure it with the same kpis as you measure your old bank from you're going to make it fail okay because you have to remember the fundamental consumer has changed yeah their behavior has changed their span patterns have changed yeah the products they want have changed but if you if you compare it exactly with the parameters of your traditional platform you're going to convert it back into so how do you convince the shareholders then i think uh i think a lot of the shareholders are already aware of the change yeah uh i i think most investors at least i see in the region are keen to see digital strategies that are focusing on new customers i think the challenge comes in the management layers because remember you have a bunch of very successful people who run a very uh, profitable bank and now you're going to get a bunch of young kids who are going to come in and say hey we know how this thing works better than you do yeah i think managing that dynamic yeah so making sure you're able to transfer the positive value from the bank to this new team yeah while allowing them to experiment i i i think that's where the dynamic is yeah if you look at almost every shareholder they want a digital plan yeah uh, and they're happy to explore which method uh, it comes from yeah uh, but i think it's a lot more about how you organize why you're doing it and how you measure success no i, I okay so in simple terms so what the banks are actually facing is a dilemma is nothing new right yeah. uh, i know nearly every other sector has gone through a similar yeah. thing i i i remember having a conversation not so long ago 7 years ago you know this particular gentleman turned around and said no way will anybody ever buy a car online yeah okay well you know That's we know changed. how it is right you know uh um uh, you know uh fundamentally uh you know ride hailing came yeah. and completely disrupted the sector 
I, I think they got that economic model slightly wrong, so therefore they're not making money. They could have got that economic model right, right. but the fact of the matter is, you diverted customers. I, I think to me, it, it, it a lot of this boils down to the human side of this, yeah. right? And I think you mentioned governance, and I think that's one part of it. I don't think it's all about the technology. I think the technology yeah. is there. I think the customers are ready for a change. There is a lot of latent demand for new things, right? Uh, it's, I think, being able to to have patience. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we, 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 were, we were talking about... Uh, having babies earlier, you know, it still takes nine months to give birth yeah. to somebody. Uh, I think, you know, if you're going to incubate something on the side, call it a digital attacker, call it, call it whatever you are, you've got to have the patience that, that you know, it, it, it's going to take a certain amount of time for that baby to be born. And then you can't use the same yardstick to measure the productivity of that baby compared yeah. to a fully grown man or a woman, right? And I think that's kind of yeah. what you're actually suggesting. I, I think I, I do buy it. I do buy into it. Changing gears, yes. right? Let's talk a little bit about now. Um, uh, and I'm not going to come across pessimistic, but I am very cautious. I think globally, I think we are deeply into the in, into what I call or what we call the funding winter, yeah. right? Um, whether we like it or not, uh, and irrespective of the of some of the announcements which happened uh, yes. in the recent past, uh, we're starting to feel the the winter creep in to this part of the world too, right? Yep. Um, now that to me begs a couple of interesting questions, right? Um, I want to hear your perspective on how deep or how cold do you think this winter will become in this region? Yeah, so, uh, look, I, I think it was well needed. Yeah, I, I, I think when money chases ideas, you know times aren't good. Yeah, and, and I think globally we had that, yeah. Uh, uh, we had funds with targets and they were looking for ideas to invest in, yeah. I think a shift in now ideas looking for money uh, is much better because you work harder, you think more. Yeah, uh, I do think we'll see a slowdown in the funding uh, cycle, but I don't think it's going to be as deep. Yeah, I think you'll see investors be more picky. Yeah, uh, ask uh, ask better multiples. Ask yeah? the right questions. Ask the right <laughs> questions. Yeah, uh, I, I think compare more and say, hey, if this is just another me too, why would it succeed? Yeah. Uh, I think they look at teams more closely. So I think they'll do all the right things you should do. Yeah. Uh, or oh, they should have always done. They should have always done. Yeah. Uh, but so I, I think uh, I, I think we'll see, continue to see funding happening. I, I think we'll see better companies get more funding, which I think is super exciting. It is. And I but 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 it has a flip side too. You know, there is some collateral damage. There might be some Good, good ideas, ideas. Yeah. who who will miss out who will miss out yeah uh, I, I agree but I, I think uh, this way you have fewer better funded ideas that actually make a big impact here uh, and you get away from the chaos of last year yeah last year was super chaotic everyone came up with an idea got funding started poaching people from each other uh, giving out insane equity uh, amounts giving money to consumers to download products they will never make money yeah and I don't think that's a good market for anyone mm, yeah? I agree with you so I, I I think we see a slowdown I still think there's a lot of interest in tomorrow's technologies and offerings in this market because the consumer, is super digital, savvy. Uh, we're lucky to be in a part of the region where oil money uh, is there, which is going to be invested in future technology. So I, I still think we continue to see interest selectively. Yeah. Uh, so I'm optimistic about okay. it. I like your uh, money chasing idea, idea chasing money. So let me just ask you a question. Honest yes. opinion, right? State of fintech in this part of the world, right? Are we genuinely innovative? Are we really solving for the real needs out here? Or are we all of those, but largely me too? So, you know, uh, at one point in my life, I used to uh, I used to work only on innovation. Yeah, And the biggest question was, do you always need to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, uh, Because remember, localization 
has a lot of merit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you look at Kareem. Yeah, uh, what I love about them is they localized what was essentially a fairly plain vanilla product once Uber had done it. Yeah, and so I think there's a lot of value in localization. Yeah, when it comes to finance, especially because the dynamics are very different. The dynamics in Egypt and the problems in Egypt are very different from those in the UAE or Saudi, yeah, uh, or Jordan or, or the other markets. Yeah, so I think there is merit to take a good idea and localize it. Yeah. Uh, now, if you look at the pace of innovation, yeah, and, and maybe uh, you look at the number of interesting ideas that are coming out, I think they are lesser. Yeah, uh, when when you look at markets like the U.S., yeah, uh, I think Asia in India, there's phenomenal stuff happening. Yeah, uh, that that is really opening up different segments and markets. So I think the pace is a lot slower. Yeah, uh, but I think we have we have a good set of companies coming up. Uh, they do need to mature a lot more. Yeah, it's not just about the idea. It's about the governance. It's making sure your security is tight, making sure your platform is scalable. Yeah, how do you get the over the hurdle of MVP? Yeah, uh, because that's the biggest pitch everyone has. Go and launch your MVP. Once you get out with the MVP, what does MVP two take? And I think that's where most fintechs break because they only thought of that much. Yeah, so the scalability aspect, I think, for me, is a bigger issue. I think it's okay to have me two ideas, localize it to the market, yeah. Uh, plug it into the network, whether it's merchants, yeah, retailers, whatever it is, yeah. Uh, and I still think you can generate value. But you have to have well thought, resilient ideas. Yeah? And I think that's where maybe there's room to improve. Yeah. And I and I again um, again I don't have to say I agree with you, but I do think it is. Um just on record, I I out of this region, I get most excited about Egypt, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I think there are some very good ideas, yeah. uh, very good businesses, solving some real problems. Now, you do have the advantage. They've got 100 million people, yeah. so there's diversity of need. And diversity of need leads to diversity in innovation, and therefore, uh, it, you know, it creates a, a, a more sort of uh, interesting playground. I do appreciate you know, in, in other countries where the population size is much smaller, the population needs are a lot more homogenous. Arguably, innovation is not that, that you know, that abundant. But I think you're very correct that they all need to mature. And I think execution is where the differentiation might actually come across, right? Uh, I, we're not going to talk much about regulation today because, I, you know, I guess everybody and there's enough written about it. But I do have to hear your perspective because I think from where you are set up and how you are setting up your bank, I'm assuming some of these regulations which are soon to come on board could have, you know, seismic impacts yeah. positively, right? Open banking, open finance being one, yes. right? Um, now, there are two two ends to the spectrum, right? One end to the spectrum is, you know, change the world. Yeah. Right, it it unleashes fintechs, uh, you know, empowers the consumer for the first time. The consumers really realize that the data is their own. Uh, all those fintechs, uh, you know, embedded finance flies, or uh, you know, off the page. Um, great stuff happens. Other side of the equation here is, well, you know, fine. The regulation happens, pushes the large banks who are arguably the holder of data. Yeah down the compliance road, they stretch it out to as far as long as possible because they don't really see the monetization for themselves in the near term. Yeah. And it's it's okay, nothing really changes. Yeah. How do you see open banking, open finance as part of the world? So, you know, it's, I, I wish I had, the, uh, I knew exactly how it would play out. Yeah, uh, I think it's a complicated answer. And I'll give you two parts to it. One, I'm a big fan of regulation, yeah. Uh, a great example is what's happening in crypto. Yeah, uh, you can't mess around with consumer money; uh, it's not yours to play with. Yeah, uh, so I, I think when it comes to open finance, I, I give you an example. About right before COVID, I, I, I was uh, meeting with uh, an executive of a bank in the UK who was in charge of open banking, mm -hmm. and this is when the, uh, they had. Uh, the, the regulations have been published. The APIs were open. Consumers could, could go and uh, choose what they want. She had been very excited about running open banking because every app out there was saying consumers want their data. The reality is consumers didn't give permission to get data. Yeah, Interesting. And 
they were below target from what I recall. I, I think they were almost 80% below target. API is open, all published, available to consumers. Yeah. Consumers uh, were just not giving consumers consent. Consumers are wary of giving out their financial data. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's that's something uh, that has to grow with time. Yeah, uh, the, the ability to give away your financial data has to grow with time. Yeah, so I think it's not just going to come and change the world. Oh, so the world's yeah. not going to be a better place tomorrow. Then. I, I, what I do <laughs> think is it gives the opportunity for more collaboration that, and better products for consumers. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I think it brings this this idea that has been brewing for a while that banks can't go at it alone anymore. Tomorrow, it's about partnerships, yeah? And that's when open banking comes up, yeah? That's where both the bank and the fintech see value in collaborating to push it to the consumer. And the consumer sees this, yeah? Uh, and I think cases will emerge, yeah? Uh, we've seen some cases, yeah? I've seen savings accounts where uh, it's worked, yeah? I think you see it on equity platforms, yeah? Uh, apps that it works. So I, I think you will see the cases. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot more. We, we, we're just beginning to see what we can do. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, and, I, and I hope it's more than just payment initiation, although I think that, that it's... Yeah, I think that will be the first one. Yeah, and, and, and I think, and, and, and to be honest with you, I think it, it is... It could be fundamentally incredibly interesting, right? You have examples of what's happening in India with UPI yeah. and others that, yeah. you know, there are alternative ways to use payments. And I think open banking will make it happen. I think account aggregation is is interesting, which will sort of possibly give life to, you know, uh, genuine PFM, I think, which is a fairly educational tool. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's hard to educate consumers. PFM is not something new. It's existed yeah, it's for, for, for decades, yeah, right? Might not, yeah, it, it might not have been seamless and so on and so forth. So I think there's a, there there is an uh, there is a, a a play to it. But in my humble opinion, I think somehow or the other the big incumbent banks have to be uh, convinced that there is a potential for them to extend the size of the pie. Yeah, absolutely. And therefore, by extending the size of the pie or enlarging the, the pizza, their Everyone slice yeah. will be bigger. So yes, they might feel like they're giving more away, yeah. but at the same time, they are, they have a position to consume all of that. Now, that's where regulation comes in and it becomes tricky. And then actually, if you go into open data where you start consuming data from non-financial sources, then I think it all gets very interesting. So I think, I do think, I'm cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I get quite excited about it, uh, as you can see in my tone, and I hope it will bring the change. We're talking incumbent banks. I'm going to come back uh, with a question. I should have asked it earlier, but you know, it, it sort of came across my mind now, so let me ask you. If I'm a bank, if I'm an incumbent bank right now, I'm kind of licking my lips, right? Um, I have this sort of need to digitally transform myself. Um, I've had a few goes at it. Maybe not really achieved the return on investment or achieved the consumer uh, 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 sort of satisfaction scores that I needed. Now, all of a sudden, I could possibly pick up a number of fintechs, um, 10 cents to a dollar, 20 cents yeah. to a dollar. And arguably, and I use the word arguably because I'm making it, I'm oversimplifying here, leapfrog that digital transformation, yeah. right? We've seen this in other parts of the world already, right? So some of the big incumbent banks like Citi and JP Morgan have been on an acquisition spree forever yeah. in terms of buying fintechs. And, you know, even when the valuations were fairly high. Do you see incumbent large banks in the region swallowing up, right? A number of fintechs in some way or the other here. Yeah. So uh, look, uh, I, I think some banks recently announced they are forming CVCs. Yeah, uh, within them. Yeah. So uh, I, I think the notion of venture funding fintechs, yeah, uh, is growing in the region. Yeah, uh, and I think will continue to grow. You know, funny enough, about 15 years ago, uh, so uh, I was working on a project where there was a company that serially acquired different companies mm -hmm. for new technology, for market share. And uh, we did a study to see why, if they acquired the number two player and they were number three player, why couldn't they get to number one? In most cases, they came to number five and six, yeah? Uh, 
And the reality is it's not just about acquiring a fintech. It's about making sure it runs with the freedom yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and the inspiration that the founders yeah, and the employees need, yeah, that, that it has the ability to go and try new things. Do you think that's possible? I think it's possible. I, I think you see some banks. I think like DBS has done it. A DBS few times, has done it. Yeah, yeah. I must say. Yeah. Uh, I, I think City does it well too in some markets. I, I, I think you have to, there has to be a fundamental shift in the way you think as a bank. Yeah? And, and you need to think more as a corporate rather than a bank. Yeah? And look at the bank as one vertical of your business and this as other verticals of your business. Yeah? Uh, you also have to increase your risk appetite and say these things are going to fail. Yeah? Uh, so I think there's a lot of shifts required. Uh, banks, very rightfully and good for the consumer, are risk averse. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. Uh, uh, you don't want them to run like crypto companies. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's a good thing they are that way. But I think it requires a different mindset. Yeah, And when I look at this, uh, my biggest worry is the demise of the fintech. Yeah, uh, I think that needs to be managed very well. Yeah, Because if you bring a bunch of smart people who are trying new things, who are inspired, and you put them through the corporate procurement process yeah, or, or whatever it is yeah as soon you start the, shrinking the dead the before they start <laughs> yeah that, that's not going to go too far so i think it requires it still requires the governance you need but it requires it in a slightly different way so it's not going to happen I, I i think cvc is an interesting way to get there i think a lot of people have created cvcs but not executed it right even corporates have not really you know yeah, you know cvcs have existed for a while for a while right yeah, um, yeah. so creating one is great right Executing against it is another thing. And then post-execution, delivering on what you've invest, invested in is a whole different story. I, I think the way it makes a difference is if you have a customer base and now you have a vested interest to give access uh, to them, then it's interesting. Yeah, Obviously, you still have to go across the people dynamics yeah, uh, of it. I think that's where the challenge is. Okay. Yeah. All right. See... Uh, I'm conscious of time. I do want to get to VO, okay. right, and talk a little bit about VO. I know it's only been six months, but you know there, there's some some questions that I must ask you. Rapid fire, three question, three or four questions, right? I, okay. I just basically want your response, top of the mind, right? right? Embedded finance in this market beyond payments and BNPL, right? Yeah. Is it going to happen? I think so, and it's a massive opportunity. But will it happen? Will absolutely. The, Will the different parties come together? I think so. Great. Okay. We hear lots and lots of chatter around Web3, right? Yeah. Whether it's in the version of digital currencies, whether it's blockchain, whether it's metaverse, whether it's crypto, okay? In no particular order. Let's start with metaverse meets banking, right? We've been seeing activities across the world. Uh, if I was to classify them into three categories, and I know I'm going to get beaten up here, uh, one is, uh, you know, marketing st um, uh, stunts, but yeah. nothing wrong with it. Secondly, some have gone as far as saying, well, we can engage with our customers slightly, mostly fear of missing out, yeah. right? Where do you think metaverse and banking sort of comes together from a substantive view? Yeah, I think, look, for me, if you're trying to put the products and services you have in the metaverse, you're getting it wrong. Okay. Yeah, it's just a marketing stunt. Yeah, I think you need to find out real commerce in the metaverse and see how you can enable it. Yeah, how you can provide. If I'm in the metaverse and I buy uh, a piece of land and I want to build something on it, yeah, uh, we say a studio, which other uh, uh, music producers can use, yeah then how do I finance it? Yeah, So I, I think there is a virtual world that is going to need money yeah, to develop. It yeah? has to. Uh, the, I think the use cases have to be right. Yeah, And, and so I, I think right now, most of the ones I've seen, uh, they're trying to take existing products. Nobody wants to visit your branch in the metaverse. They don't want to do it in the real world. Why would they go to the virtual world for it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
So uh, I, I think when the real cases emerge of real business in metaverse, I think that's when you see real opportunities. No, I agree, and I I, I think there's some interesting things happening in South Korea, and, yeah. and I think it's it's it, it's a longer discussion. But you, you're correct. I think the the use cases need to be relevant. They have to be valuable. They have to be material. And 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 I think the banks need to look at this as different, right? Uh, yes, it is an extension of your internet or it's an extension of your digital strategy. But I do think that the leap is a little bit more than just incremental, yeah. right? Let's talk a little bit about crypto. Right, um, and, and I'm not interested to talk about everything which has happened yeah. here recently with FTX and and all those you know various scams, scandals, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, crypto is very hot in this part of the world, and especially in the UAE. Uh, right, your views on three topics: CBDCs, yeah. digital currencies, yeah. right? Sort of CBDC, CBDC is one of them, yeah. but minus yeah. CBDC, right? And what role do you see sort of banks play going forward in the evolution of this whole crypto space in this part of the world? Yeah, so I think CBDCs, I think are fantastic. Yeah, uh, I, I think if you look at the friction in banking, it's largely caused because there's very few currencies of choice. Yeah, uh, You have two or three currencies and you have to play by the rules. Yeah, I think CBDCs make things easier. I, I give you the simplest example. The, the Chinese Yuan, the uh, digital currency they launched. Imagine if you could hold that in your wallet here mm -hmm. and you are importing goods from China. You could instantly play your supplier. You could order smaller packages you can do a lot more use your capital more uh, efficiently yeah which i think is a lot harder right now with the current fiat system so i think they are fantastic uh, I, i'm looking forward to them i think on the cryptocurrencies that are non government uh, or central bank driven i think stable coins backed by real value again the potential of payments globally happening instantly yeah uh, because of this is phenomenal and I think it changes commerce for the world. Yeah, so I'm super optimistic. I think it has to be well governed. Yeah, and regulated. But if it's done, I I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, lastly, was uh, your question on? Uh, sorry, I forgot the third one. Well, I, I, what is the role of the banks? Are the role play? of the banks. Yeah, I, I think the role of the banks is their consumers are going to change in needs. If I can go and tell my customer, hey, you can pay your Chinese supplier in an instant. Yeah, uh, because of this, that is the role, providing this channel and access to the consumer. So I have my dirham wallet, I have my dollar wallet, and I have my e one wallet. I think the banks are the distribution engine for this. Yeah, I think some banks might decide to dwell into re uh, releasing their old st uh, stable coins, but I think it's a stretch. Yeah, I mean you need to know your stuff to do this stuff. But what you do have is phenomenal distribution. Use that and this phenomenal product that's coming, uh, and the governance. The banks have the governance, yeah. So use that to their advantage, and uh, I think you have a really interesting space. So, so, do you see crypto getting increasingly regulated? I, I do hope it gets regulated. But isn't that contrary to the whole argument? I think uh, you know uh, what's funny is the reason for not being regulated was it's safe. Yeah. And I think we've seen the fact that it's not. Yeah, uh, it needs to be regulated because at the end of the day, you need to protect the assets of the consumer. Yeah, uh, and without regulation, we are seeing the results. Yeah, but but the FT so let me the FTX scam sort of smelt more like a Ponzi scheme and more made off than actually crypto. No, but quite a few of them have followed the same exact path. Fair enough. Taking consumer money, not holding it separately, not managing it by a certain cert, uh, set of standards. And then suddenly you're eating into consumer money, maybe for buying yachts, maybe to get more <laughs> consumers. Yeah, uh, And I think that regulation has to happen. It can't be just a vehicle uh, for greed to take over. You have to protect Jay, it. you just kill the yacht market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I really believe regulation protects consumers. Uh, it has to be regulated differently. That I fully agree with. Yeah, And and, and that's going to be the interesting one. I, I use the word differently because then the regulator needs to come up the curve yeah. in terms of understanding a lot of these products and services Absolutely. so that they don't use the, if I may say, 
the the current framework of how the fiat economy is regulated and sort of uh, uh, you know apply enforce it apply it right i totally agree that exchanges need to be regulated yeah. i'm still not quite sure if crypto needs to be regulated yeah right uh, I, i again distribution yeah. of crypto needs to be regulated but uh, do I, and i think the debate goes yeah, on and again you know I, this is a quick fire section let's come to vio I I think if I did not congratulate you at the start of the of the episode then congratulations on Thank the you. launch of Vio. Uh, I should also say that and it's not because you're sitting on the chair and I think everybody who sat on that chair knows that I don't give compliments just because people come into the studio but uh, I did my homework. I called up uh, a few people who have actually become your customers and they were small businesses or professional businesses uh, and so far you know Uh, it seems like you guys are doing the right things i think uh, you know the response was it was uh, it was uh, efficient it was uh, interesting it was simple uh, i think these are the kind of things people want to hear uh, because let's be honest smes get treated like Uh, I, i i don't even want to use the word because i think I, i you know the show might get banned for the future so so that's great i've got a question to ask you right yeah. two parts of the question talk to me about the genesis of of view and where the thought comes from i'm going to make it three parts there you Fine. go All right. That, that's creative uh, license for <laughs> for having a show the genesis of view what do you mean by being the region's first platform bank yeah. so you know and third what made you decide or what made the bank decide that they want to go after a segment which every bank says that they want to go after but nobody really goes after yeah the smes no i think great questions yeah so uh, uh look the genesis of weo was if you look at the ua strategy they have a digital strategy they want to become a leading digital player Yeah, and I think they've talked uh, a lot about it. Mm-hmm. As they evaluated what is going to help them do this, they realized there's some fundamentals yeah, that need to be different. And one was financial services yeah, and banking. So I think the genesis came from the shareholders saying, how do we build a bank that enables tomorrow's business? That was the objective. Weo's objective is to enable tomorrow's business. Yeah. Uh, so... That was the start of it. It's not about building the same products you're seeing right now just in a nice cooler app yeah, uh, with more insights. It's, it's really thinking about what a business is going to do next and how can we enable it, yeah? which I think pertinently brings us to our next question. What is a platform bank? Uh, I think in the evolution of banking, there is one more stage. Yeah, and this is one which I, I think is critical because it's driven by technology and it's driven by a massive shift in consumer behavior. Uh, so in our platform bank, we have three capabilities. Yeah, One is we launch consumer apps. So we launched our SME app, and I'll talk about that. We have a retail one coming, and we'll have a few more coming in that way. Yeah, Those apps, we make the user experience better, simpler, more fairly priced, Yeah, and more insightful. Yeah, uh, So that's our what a lot of the back banks focus on we have two big other areas that we think are going to define tomorrow's business one we talked a little bit about embedded finance yeah embedded finance is a critical vertical of ours yeah uh, we believe tomorrow's business is going to happen through digital platforms and i give you a simple example if i'm selling on an e-commerce platform as an sme why can't i just click a button and get my loan all the data is there Why do I need to print all that stuff out, go to a bank and ask for a loan? Yeah? Or if I want to use payments, why can't I just embed the payments in the platform I'm using? Okay, so I've got to ask you a question you can choose not to answer. Tell me. Um, Etheslot is a significant investor. Yes. Are you going to be working together on the embedded finance? I think we'll work on various areas yeah, with our shareholders. Yeah? And I think we have to prioritize that based on Uh, where is their consumer value? Yeah, so we'd absolutely love to work with them on this. Yeah, And embedded finance across industry verticals is really important. If you look at almost every industry, there are digital platforms that are coming up that are beginning to control these industries. Consumers do not want to leave those digital platforms to go to something else. You have to bring your service there. And it's not just about availing services there. It's making sure you work with the platform to create something unique that makes 
sense for that service. Yeah, and so embedded finance is a massive uh, part of our uh, objectives. So why SMEs then? So we have one last one, yeah. which is banking as a service. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And yeah. uh, banking as a service is critical, largely because of a lot of the stuff we've talked about. That's a lot of investment, not just in fintech, in other tech companies. You shouldn't spend a year trying to get a debit card or a payment system or a score or a KYC system yeah, just for your uh, app. You should be able to consume it. Yeah, uh, And so we see this as the other opportunity. And, and so we think the three combined help us serve tomorrow's businesses because they're focused on digital business. No, and that's very interesting. So, so when we talked about open banking, you mentioned embedded finance or we mentioned embedded finance, you talked about banking as a service. I think there's like a symbiotic relationship between yeah. the three of them, right? If you align all of these together, you unlock the journey, you don't. So, so, so I think you've in a way kind of answered my next question, which is sort of where you're heading. So what's going to be the differentiator? And like, who do you see as competitors? Yeah. Right? Um, and maybe I've asked it the other way around, but so who do you see as your competitors? And, and, and how do you sort of constantly, consistently differentiate yourself? Yeah, uh, so I'll answer the one other question you asked, which was on SMEs. Why oh, sorry, SMEs? apologies. That's yeah. okay. We started during COVID. Yes. And, uh, and SMEs were struggling. They were really struggling. Well, they were struggling before COVID. They were struggling also. before, <laughs> and COVID just made it worse. And uh, I think our shareholders said, it's important we address this issue. Right. Uh, uh, so uh, we said, okay, we're going to take uh, uh, work on this. I, I think we've done a decent job. We're just starting. We worked with a lot of SMEs to figure out what they need. We just don't want to give you an account to transact. We want to become your operating system. You never started your business to manage a bank account. You started your business to run it. How can we take all that admin away? How can we help you with easy expense management so you're ready for that? How do we have, help you save money so that you're not scrambling during uh, uh, rent when you have to pay rent? Yeah. So we are, uh, we've embedded invoicing in there so you can track where your money comes in. So we are making a shift from just being providing you with an account, which I think is the most basic necessity that SME had, to how do we become your operating system? How do we make it easy for you? You want a payment gateway, we've partnered with Stripe. You click a button, fill up two screens, and you're in line to get a payment gateway at a fantastic rate. So I, I think that is our ambition, is how do we make your focus go back on your running your business and take away everything else. Yes, I love hearing that. Because see, I, my working hypothesis, and we did a very similar study in terms of you know uh, needs of the SME. My working view here is, if you really want to crack SMEs, you go down the ecosystem approach, yeah. right? Uh, you're already on the right side, but right, my encouragement for whatever it's worth to view, and you can discount whatever I have to say, is to even think beyond where you are thinking, and I'm sure you guys are, right? Because uh, we did a piece of work and we realized that SMEs consume something like 120 different services over a yeah. five-year period, right? Yeah. And, and the fact of the matter are, they're time-starved, yeah. right? Um, uh, and they're, they have limited resources. So if they can find someone who can provide them an ecosystem or become a companion, and I, I don't want to use the word super app for SMEs, yeah, but right? But is. you understand what I mean, yeah, an yeah, ecosystem absolutely. approach. I do think you start collecting all those data points, which reduces your risk exposure because you get to know them a lot better, right? You're able to build a relationship in areas which are more relevant than others, right? And, and therefore, you know, you can turn them into profitable yeah. relationships. Um, I, and I, you know, this is music to my ear in, in the sense of what you So differentiation, right? So, yeah. so who do you see as your competitors? Um, and, and this is the last question, to be honest with you. So who do you see as your competitors? And, and what's going to be sort of the differentiating backbone for VO going forward, at least for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so uh, I, I think on the competition side, I, I think looking at competitors, uh, I think it requires a different lens. Yeah, I, I believe in tomorrow's way of banking. So many we look at as potential partners. Yeah, and I think that is the one big shift. Yeah, uh, now competition for us comes obviously from the existing banks. Yeah, uh, because we want to go out and get customers and give them this amazing experience that we're working on. Yeah. Uh, so existing banks, yeah. Uh, I, I think the other competitors are new 
platforms that are coming up that are offering financial services. Yeah, and we're beginning to see them. Uh, yeah, whether it's a BNPL player or uh, uh, something else that's focused in the payment space or uh, one of the other spaces. I think what is different from us is we just don't look at them as a competitor, but we can say, hey, if they've got something better, the person who decides what the consumer gets is the consumer. Yeah, uh, I think one other days where you decide for the consumer, this is what you get. Yeah, so I think to us we look at this and say, hey, how can we partner together? And to to your previous point of making the pie bigger, if we can make the pie bigger, get more value, serve more customers, then there's value in it for us. Yeah, so I think we look at competition, but we also look at the same folks collaborating with uh, with us. Yeah, and I give you a simple example. If you look at digital platforms like maybe food delivery platforms, yeah, if they want to offer a card, the bank will look at it and say, hey, this is competition. Yeah? They're going to cannibalize my revenue. But I think collaborating can unleash a huge set of revenue pools that hasn't been used till now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So for us, competition is interesting. We see global players who can come to our market and uh, uh, be uh, competitors. So we think there's a large number of competitors. How do we make sure we are differentiated? First, I think it's focusing on our core principle. We are in the business of serving customers. That is what we are in the business of. Yeah, It just happens to be banking. Yeah, And with that, I think our key differentiator is going to be how we continuously focus on serving customers. Yeah, Why should you join WIO? How do we make you get ahead faster, better, with more knowledge because you're with us? And we have to keep on focusing on that. I think the other two uh, parts that I think help us differentiate is both our embedded finance and our banking as a service. I think there's very few players who are doing this well. Uh, well, we are, <laughs> I don't think there's anyone doing that well. We sorry. are investing heavily in this, yeah. And I think we will start opening up a whole new set of businesses related to money uh, or revenue streams related to money that don't exist in this market. Yeah, So uh, serving existing customers through bucket one, building new businesses through two and three. Yeah? Uh, so I think that keeps us differentiated at least for the next few years. Yeah, no, and I love that, that, you know, I love the term and I think that's a great way to kind of end the episode. I, I love this term, cooperation, which is, yeah. you know, collaborating on, on with competitors. Because it serves a, you know, it's a win-win situation. It serves the, well, it's a win-win-win situation if you include the customer to it. And I think it's refreshing to think uh, in that way. And I think kudos to you if you can take that ideology and then turn that into, you know, action and convince your shareholders and stakeholders that I think that is better for VO. It's better for the UAE. Um, and I guess... Uh, well, it's better for the customer and hence it's better for the UAE, yeah. right? So with that, um, I'm going to say thank you, but it's still not over. All right. Okay. Last this question. This sounds tricky. No, no, it is tricky. It is tricky, but it is fun, okay. right? So one of the things uh, we decided at the start of the uh, uh, season was we wanted to ask everybody who sits on the couch one question, which is going to get compiled and possibly shared with schools. Okay. Right? Um, so your audience is somewhere at the age group of 10 to 12-year-olds. Okay. Right? And and we'll ask you just one question and give a very simple answer for yeah. them to understand. Digital banking for a 12-year-old. All right. I'll take a shot at this. Please. Yep. So uh, I think it's a simpler, smarter way to manage your money so that you can achieve your goals faster. That is what digital banking is. Yeah, It's just a simpler, smarter, easier way to manage your money with the right insights so that you get to grow faster. I, I think that's what it's about. Excellent. So. Uh, that's a great answer. We will make sure that we we clip that and you know we'll compile that with the all the other forty two episodes and we will we'll give it to you know schools out and they so choose to share it with their their classes, then I guess it can be a part of some sort of a financial uh, education, education program. Yep. Jesh, thanks a lot. I appreciate you taking time this late in the evening. Um, uh, I hope we're not going to keep you away from, from work or family time. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. We've not met in the past. I think our paths have 
crossed in a number of different ways. I think we've known each other sort of like virtually because this is a small world, but uh, I look forward to our next conversation in, in some form or the other. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's been great chatting about this. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us. That was Jayesh Patel, CEO of VO Bank. Uh, if you are an SME, check them out. Um, uh, and this is not sort of uh, an, a couchonomics endorsement, but more from what I've heard from my friends who are SMEs. Uh, he has mentioned that there is going to be a consumer app which is going to come down the line. I should have asked him when it's coming, but I'm sure we'll hear all about it when it's there. I'm actually going to download it and definitely give it a run uh, or a test run and then be very promptly giving my feedback to Jayesh now that I know his email and, and his mobile number. Uh, so with that, goodbye uh, till the next week. Um, goodbye.